About 25 miles south of Chicago, there's a stretch of water where nothing lives. Nothing at all. There's nothing left alive except insects and bacteria. It wasn't pollution or overfishing that destroyed everything here. It was electricity. There are several wide grids of electrodes at the bottom of the river giving off 2.3 volts every 2.5 milliseconds. And if someone falls into the water, nobody will even try to save them. But what kind of place is it? And why does it still exist despite being deadly dangerous? An unobtrusive reminder to have some coffee if you forget to do so at the end of the video. So how did it all begin? It happened on the morning of December 3rd, 2009. The Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal looked like a crime scene. Its banks were laced with yellow police tape and all roads to the water were blocked by local police. Reporters were hanging around. Behind the cordon, you could see the workers, all 400 of them who were killing the river. This is what the operation leaders explained to the press. The river needed to be poisoned with electricity to win the war against the fish. And gradually, the fish began to float to the surface one by one. Witnesses saw their white bellies. Some fish died immediately, others drifted for a while, but by the end of the day, thousands of fish were dead. They were pulled out with nets. In the end, the poisoning of the canal resulted in about 55,000 pounds of dead fish. There was not a single creature left on the 5.6 miles of the canal. The massive electric attack cost taxpayers about $3 million and was unprecedented. But soon it had to be repeated. Just six months after the first poisoning of the canal, another one was carried out. It brought in another 99,000 pounds of fish, including about 40 different species. And all of this was done for one reason only. Animal DNA was found in the water where it shouldn't have been. People had to take extreme measures to keep this creature from moving upstream. And for this, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers built an electric barrier. As I mentioned, these were several wide 157-foot electrode grids, each releasing 2.3 volts every 2.5 milliseconds. Of course, the barriers don't cover the entire canal. They're within a 1,500-foot stretch and create an electric field in the water. The equipment that controls all of this is kept in a separate building. And that building is so dangerous that it's simply impossible for someone off the street to get in. Not because it guards some super scary secrets, it's just that they worry about people's lives. There are three electric barriers set up at different points in the channel, and they work constantly, constantly and effectively to make sure nothing survives in this water. The idea of creating such a barrier was first discussed back at the end of the last century. In 1996, Congress authorized the Army Corps to develop such a device, so the Corps did it, and then gradually set up barriers in the Chicago Canal. The first barrier has been there since 2002. The second was put up and started operating in 2009. The third has been functioning since 2011. And considering that they're still working, the barriers seem to be handling their task well. And then I thought, three electric devices in the water that kill all life in it? What would happen if a person fell into the channel? It turns out that experts even have a joke about this. They say that a place with barriers for fish is the only stretch of water where the Coast Guard would rescue to save you. And this isn't even an exaggeration. As soon as you step into the water, that's it. From that moment on, you're on your own. There aren't even any serious barriers, just a fence that separates people from the electrified water. And even that fence was put up solely because some kids or not so bright adults might find the canal attractive. According to the law, the states can be held liable for any injury someone gets in such a place or nearby, but only if there isn't a fence, which is why the fence is there. Everything else is on the person who climbs over it. According to the security service, if you swim almost anywhere within the electric barrier zone, you risk either involuntary muscle contractions or ventricular fibrillation. In other words, as soon as you enter the barrier zone, electrical impulses block your own nervous system. Needless to say, if you have to swim and breathe to stay alive, not being able to control your muscles, breathe, or maintain a stable heartbeat will be a real problem. Therefore, the entire area is off limits not only to civilians, but also to the Coast Guard. Nobody should go into this water. Basically, this is the worst spot for swimming. So no one has fallen into the water yet, but don't forget, we're talking about a navigable canal. So one barge crew, despite the warning signs, tried to moor near the object using a metal cable. Metal cable, near the water under tension. What could possibly go wrong? The connection threw a spark, which could have blown up the barge if it had been carrying a more flammable cargo. 
Fortunately for everyone, nothing caught fire and no one got hurt. But don't think that safety measures are limited to fences and warning signs that some people for some reason ignore. There's, for example, a brochure that says there's no safe method for rescuing someone from the water if it's in an electrified zone. That means if a person or even some object falls off your boat, the U.S. Coast Guard won't try to save them. And they don't recommend you try it either. Rescuers can only step in when the person ends up 460 feet downstream. Otherwise, any contact with the person in the water could endanger lives. Just think about how this completely undermines their training. It goes against everything they've been taught. Don't save. Well, and to make it easier for the rescuers, special attention is given to public awareness. And you know what works even better than the threat of death? Oddly enough, the threat of a hefty fine and possible jail time. People can be really weird sometimes. But the main question that everyone asks when they hear about this channel under electric current is, why? What kind of war with fish are you talking about? So what's the reason behind this? The electric barrier was set up to keep fish from swimming up the shipping and sanitary canals into the Great Lakes. For those who aren't familiar, I'll explain. It's such a system of freshwater lakes on the border between the US and Canada, and they're the largest in the world. They hold 21% of the world's surface freshwater. In short, these are incredibly important bodies of water. These bodies of water, along with all their biodiversity, are now under threat from the invasion of Asian carp. We've talked about this in previous videos. Asian carp are invasive fish and incredibly voracious. Many ecologists are worried that Asian carp could completely wipe out the fishing industry in the Great Lakes. However, electricity is still keeping the invaders at bay, and the lakes remain free of them for now, at least the larger ones because electricity works better on bigger fish in the water, it doesn't kill them but rather repels them when they come into contact with a strong electric field. If you're concerned that people came with their own agendas and destroyed a bunch of innocent fish in their natural habitat, it turns out it was actually a bit different. The channel that was electrified was built by humans. It's not a natural body of water, it was created to connect the Mississippi River with the Great Lakes, boost shipping, support the economy and also to divert waste from Chicago. Before the channel was constructed, the city dumped its sewage and industrial waste right into the Chicago River, which flowed into Lake Michigan, a source of drinking water. Do you see the problem here? Well, the people of Chicago did. News reports from the 1890s revealed that about 2,000 residents were dying from typhoid fever every year. And then when the channel was dug, fish appeared in it, and of course started using it to move towards the Great Lakes. Before barriers were built, people watched for almost 10 years as two species of invasive Asian carp moved up the Mississippi and Illinois rivers. They were nearly at the Great Lakes, and they needed to be stopped right away. If it were a local species they were dealing with, people might have thought of less drastic measures. But these fish are just like nothing else. They don't just move to a new spot, they literally seize the area. They take over it. When these fish end up in a new body of water, they attack. Well, they attack all around. Some change the food chain from the bottom, wiping out plankton populations that all other fish depend on. No one can handle such competition. While some invaders feed on plankton, others are eating the local mussels and snails, some of which are already at risk of extinction. Others are even destroying food chains by changing communities of plants and vertebrates and fish. But it's not just the inhabitants of the water bodies that suffer from the invaders. These carp regularly send boaters to the emergency rooms with concussions and split lips because they have a habit of suddenly jumping out of the water. People even wear protective gear while fishing, but it doesn't help everyone. Naturally, any water activities or sports and bodies of water with invasive fish become dangerous. And now imagine if these fish make it to the Great Lakes, which have over 4 million recreational boats. That, by the way, is about a third of all boats in the U.S., so things will just get worse. Oh, and now it's time for my favorite question. How did such a dangerous invasive species make its way to North America? Well, just venture a guess. Yeah, these fish were brought to the USA by people because they planned for the fish to clean the rivers of weeds. But instead, the fish escaped from people and bred with an alarming force, turning from helpers into conquerors. And at the same time, they became a serious expense for the government. In the end, over $100 million were spent fighting to keep Asian carp from invading the Great Lakes. The good news is that people are winning so far, mainly thanks to that very system of electric barriers. Before the idea of using electricity came up, there was an even crazier plan. 
just filling part of the canal with dirt, cutting off its connection with the river. But to keep the goods moving through it, they suggested installing a lift that would carry the goods over the blocked section and then put them back on the ship. Of course, no carp would ever get through such an obstacle, but the plan was still considered too expensive. Annually, over 600 million cargo shipments go through the canal. Unfortunately, because of the fight against invasive species, many native fish have suffered. On the day when they poisoned the fish, there was a problem. Fish of six species floated to the surface, but none of them were invasive. And among the 55,000 pounds of dead fish that I mentioned at the very beginning, they didn't find any carp either. In the end, after three days of poisoning, they found only one Asian carp. But you know what? Apparently, even electricity doesn't provide 100% protection against invasive species. In the summer of 2017, one carp was discovered where it shouldn't have been, past the electric barrier. How this big adult fish managed to swim so far is unclear. However, it became one of only two fish caught beyond the electric barriers in the past 10 years. There are, of course, some ideas. A fish can cross the electrified zone if it gets stuck in the wake of the barge, that is, if it swims straight behind it. Besides that, metal barges can basically suck electricity out of the water when moving through the barrier zone. This creates a small but safe spot through which fish can swim and end up behind the barrier. But all of those are rare, extremely unlikely cases. Too many factors have to align for this to happen. It's too early to panic, but barriers clearly have a flaw that should be fixed. Not long ago, $1.2 billion was allocated to improve the barrier. But they say that no matter how expensive this project is, the cost of failure is much higher. The plan is this. Upgrade the barrier so that the fish moving upstream will have to get past a series of half-mile-long obstacles. And each of these obstacles should push it back so that, in the end, the fish just changes its mind. Seriously, does it even want to deal with this? They've even already developed these obstacles. The first one should be a dense curtain of air bubbles and a row of underwater speakers that emit noises at frequencies and volumes that scare away the fish. The second challenge is a highly unfavorable environment. Fish will be swimming in a concrete box with nothing at all inside. No ledges where the fish could rest while moving against the current, no food sources, and from the fish's perspective, nothing at all to make it want to go on. Well, the fish that do manage to get past the first obstacles will face an electric repellent. It causes an unpleasant tingling, and if the fish goes further into the electrode grid, it'll be stunned. A stunned fish definitely won't swim against the current. It won't swim anywhere at all. It'll just be dragged downstream, back through all these obstacles, and it's unlikely the fish will try to go through all this again. Besides, there's no point for it in doing so unless it's searching for its lost son. But hey, we're not in an animated movie. But even if all of this doesn't help, and the fish swims, hitchhikes between the barges, it'll end up in the flushing lock. It creates turbulent flows that can swirl the fish around and push it back downstream. Actual construction of all this won't start until October 2024 and won't be completed until July 2029. Hopefully the invasive species will wait. Electrofishing versus invasive carp. While some biologists are saving the Great Lakes, their colleagues in Kentucky have started using a shocking method to fight the invasion of Asian carp. Literally shocking. Schools of fish leap out of the water and are then stunned by an electrofishing lure. As a result, complete stillness on the surface, enough for biologists to gather the fish for counting and measuring. The shock doesn't harm the animals, it just makes them immobile for a while, so people can figure out how many of these fish are in the water. Spoiler, that's way too many. This works only with carp. Recent research has shown that all these electric barriers can only stop Asian carp. They don't block other invasive species at all. Mussels, crayfish, snails, zooplankton, and other similar animals continue to threaten the Great Lakes despite all the barriers humans have built. Furthermore, crayfish, for example, don't die from electrical shocks that are 400% stronger than what the barrier can provide. Scientists are currently looking for new methods to save the Great Lakes from everyone. One option is to use barriers made of carbon dioxide bubbles, but it's still in the research stage. Not quite as advertised. According to the gathered data, the Great Lakes are already quite devastated by other invasive creatures, at least Lake Michigan. There are now about 180 invasive species living there, and none of them are shy. 
they eat everything in sight and reproduce everywhere they can. So if the Asian carp actually make it to the Great Lakes, they might be really disappointed. Scientists even compare the fish getting into Lake Michigan to landing in a desert. Not literally, of course, but it's definitely not what you'd expect after breaking through so many layers of protection. Australia and its methods In Australia, they also have problems with invasive carp, but they've developed a completely different method to fight them. No barriers, electricity, or bubble curtains. Officials plan to start using a strain of fish herpes virus. The cost of the whole operation is expected to be around 15 million Australian dollars. But it's worth it, because the virus will quickly kill the invasive carp. But it won't affect the local fish, they're just immune. Fish rebranding Here's another way to fight invasive fish in the U.S. Experts suggest controlling the population simply by eating carp. A rebranding campaign for Asian carp could potentially raise their value, making these fish more economically viable for people. In Asia, invasive fish are very popular, but Americans don't yet share such love. Carp are bony and kinda hard to fillet, but there's no issue that good advertising can't fix, right? I just realized I gave you an unobtrusive reminder to have some coffee at the beginning of the video. That means you owe me a like right now. See you later.